Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This morning we have one more plenary lecture. That is the International Catalysis Award lecture. The speak will be Professor John Hartwig. Hartwig. <coughs> it's my great pleasure to uh, give you a brief introduction of uh, the speaker. Professor Hartwig received his bachelor's degree in 1986 from Princeton University and a PhD degree in 1990 from the University of California, Berkeley. After American Cancer Society postdoctoral fellowship with Stephen Lippard, he was assistant, associate, full, and finally Dubon Professor of Chemistry at Yale University. In 2006, he moved to University of Illinois, Urbana Champion, where he is currently the chemist Reinhardt Professor for Chemistry. Professor uh, Hartwig's work is mainly in uh, organic chemistry and homogeneous catalysis. His research focuses on the discovery and understanding of new reactions catalyzed by transition metal complexes. His work has been well recognized by organic chemistry and uh, homogeneous catalysis field. He received, received a number of predecessor awards and honors, although he's young. I just mentioned some of his uh, prestigious awards, including AC Corp Scholar Award in 1998, and from his uh, very early uh, scientific career. And the IUPAC Award in Synthetic Organic Chemistry 2004. American Chemical Society Award in Organic Metallic Chemistry 2006. Makayama Award from the Society of Synthetic Organic Chemistry of Japan 2007. Tetrahedral Young Investigate Award in Organic Synthesis 2007. The Paul uh, Relate Award of the Organic Reaction Catalyst Society 2008. And uh, uh, at this Congress, he received the International Catalyst Award from the International Association for Catalyst Society. This is the first time our society awards a young scientist from homogeneous catalysis. Uh, now, uh, let me uh, Congratulate Professor uh, John Hartwig, and welcome John to give the lecture, please. Okay, well thank you very much for the kind introduction, Professor Lee, and let me uh, express my sort of overwhelming uh, gratitude to, uh, uh, to this award, uh, having been from outside of this community. I think it, uh, it really uh, speaks to the progress that's been made in the area of homogeneous catalysis, not just for the synthesis of commodity chemicals, but for the synthesis of fine chemicals, pharmaceuticals, polymers, and so forth. So in part, I think uh, I'd like to uh, acknowledge many of my colleagues in that area, uh, and in a minute I'll also acknowledge uh, many of the students. My slides are going forward. Why are my slides going forward? Uh, so anyway, so let me uh, uh, thank very much the selection committee and, uh, and express my appreciation for, uh, for this award and for your attention here today. So what I'd like to do today is to tell, give you a, sort of a broad scope of what some of the objectives are for the research in my program. Uh, and to uh, sort of highlight what uh, some of the aspects are that we're trying to really develop, not just in my group, but in the community as a whole. And actually, we saw a little bit of that in the, uh, or much of that in the last lecture, which is uh, to develop catalysts that are useful, uh, but also to develop principles uh, and to use those principles and mechanistic understanding uh, to ultimately be able to design catalysts uh, for useful synthetic transformations. And the transformations that I'll talk about today are largely ones that are uh, applicable to, the, to organic synthesis and fine chemical synthesis. Let's see, how do we work this? 
So first let me, uh, before I uh, sort of run out of time at the end and, uh, and have to rush through acknowledgements, let me just first thank the students in my group and really sort of transfer the con uh, any congratulations to them because after all, uh, this isn't really an award to the principal investigator, this is an award to the people who are in the laboratory who are doing the work and maybe more so to the students and postdocs who have really done the discovery process of much of what I'll talk about today. So um, this is uh, a relatively current picture of the, the people in my group. So today I'm going to talk about uh, using transition metal uh, complexes. All of these will be monomer complexes, so a single, a single metal with ligands wrapped around it, uh, to do uh, transformations that form carbon heteratom bonds. And much of organometallic chemistry and, and catalysis with those compounds over the years focused on forming carbon-carbon bonds. So uh, what we'd like to be doing in our program is to be able to extend that, those types of processes to making carbon nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, boron bonds, uh, but also trying to understand the principles involved in that. And it seems that there's an automatic timer on my slide, so how can, uh, is there any way to change that? I, have, <laughs> I don't have my computer here. Um, so we'll, we'll try to do the best at this. Uh, so the, so some of the principles that I, I talk about in an introductory organometallic class are outlined here, where if uh, the transition metal, um, hmm, this is going to be a problem. I wonder if someone can address that problem. So the, um, the principles involved here are that the transition metal, uh, how do we get my, pardon? Press very hard, okay. Uh, here we are. So <laughs> the transition metal involved in the chemistry that I'll talk about today are the late transition metals, things like iridium, rhodium, um, ruthenium, uh, and, and uh, palladium, and platinum. And so the bond between those transition metals and, and an organometallic, in an, or, in an organometallic complex where R would be an alkyl group, um, are really largely covalent bonds. And so one way to think of this is in terms of the differences in electron negativity. So the difference in electron negativity between palladium and carbon is actually smaller than the difference in electron negativity between carbon and nitrogen. Okay? So if an amine has a covalent bond, then these organometallic compounds that I'll talk, that have been sort of the, the foundation of this area are really covalent <coughs> bonds. But if we think about the compounds I'll talk about today with metal nitrogen and oxygen uh, bonds, now the difference in electron negativity between the metal and the heteratom is larger, so those bonds become more polar, more ionic, but also the heteratom brings, brings with it an electron pair, uh, which is basic. And so, that electron, so uh, that electron pair could become involved in the reaction chemistry. And I will also today talk about uh, compounds with transition metal boron bonds, and now, in that case, the polarization of that bond is in the opposite direction because the electron negativities are reversed. And the boron uh, then brings with it also a non-bonded orbital on the heteratom, but it is now unoccupied. Okay, and so the one question then is how will that affect the reaction chemistry? So as we think about the types of reactions that we would like to catalyze over the, the years of the program, uh, years of my, uh, the research of my group, um, we've turned to some of the classic or reactions catalyzed by organometallic species. And you'll see how we've sought to extend those to the formation of carbon heteratom bonds. So for example, uh, uh, one of the processes, of course, well known for many years is hydrogenation, now largely explored in, with homogeneous systems for asymmetric hydrogenation. One success story of CH activation has been the dehydrogenation of alkanes, where of course this is uphill, but if one consumes the H2, in principle one could generate uh, alpha olefins. Uh, nucleophilic substitution processes on aliphatic systems like allylic uh, electrophiles has been widely used in natural product synthesis, uh, and so that's one uh, reaction we've been interested in, uh, and the cross-coupling, so nucleophilic aromatic substitution, classically to make new carbon-carbon bonds at aromatic systems, is another process that now is widely used in the area of material science, uh, um, natural product synthesis, and pharmaceuticals. So we have been interested in, if you will, transmuting these processes. So instead of adding hydrogen to an olefin, as can be done with many catalysts, adding an amine to an olefin to give either the terminal or branched product. 
And so we've been able to do that with a system that I show here, uh, which is a rhodium complex wrapped by this uh, A to 6 bound aryan ligand tethered to a phosphine. Uh, and I won't go into these uh, topics in any detail, but just point out that we can now add primary and secondary amines intramolecularly across olefins to make nitrogen heterocycles that are the kinds of molecules that comprise um, many uh, drugs. In the area of nucleophilic aliphatic substitution, it's well known that palladium complexes will catalyze the additions of nucleophiles to allylic electrophiles. Now, if there's a single substituent on the owl group, what comes out of this is a achiral product. So that can be useful in some cases, but we've been really interested in finding other metals that will catalyze this process, reverse the regioselectivity, uh, so that one gets the branch product, and to do this with high enantioselectivity. And it turns out that an iridium catalyst uh, generated from a precursor containing cyclooctadiene will do just that. We get branched products, products from amines or alkoxide or some carbon nucleophiles. And the ligand that we start with is a so-called phosphoramidite ligand, uh, where the metal binds to the phosphorus in the middle here. But what we've shown recently is that the uh, actual owl intermediate in this system, in the active catalyst is shown here, uh, where the, the iridium has cleaved a CH bond of one of these methyl groups to make a metallocycle. The cyclooctene is still on there, uh, and this is the structure of the active species. But what I'd like to spend most of my time on today is talking about uh, the other two types of processes, one that is uh, related to the CH activation, the dehydrogenation of alkanes. And so instead of removing hydrogen and making a carbon-carbon pi bond, uh, has, as has been done with some transition metal catalysts, we've been interested in finding reagents that will drive off H2 by coupling two fragments, one of them being a completely unactivated CH bond of an alkane. And in another manifestation of this process, we've been interested in finding reagents that will do the same with arenes, and will do so with control dictated by steric effects, so that the types of products that we would get would be the different isomers of the products that would be formed by this sort of elect electrophilic aromatic substitution chemistry that we have all learned about in sophomore organic chemistry. So the second half of the talk will focus on the cross-coupling area, uh, where there are now many nickel and palladium complexes, both heterogeneous as well as homogeneous catalysts that will uh, lead to this transformation. And we've been interested in finding uh, palladium catalysts that will lead to the formation of amines, ethers, and sulfides from uh, amines, alcohols, and, thio uh, and thiols. In chemistry, I don't really have time to talk about in any detail today, a related process has been to use enolates as nucleophiles to substitute on aromatic halides to make alpha halo carbonyl compounds. Again, very important for medicinal chemistry. Uh, naproxen, Aleve, these painkillers have this basic structure. Okay, so why have these uh, catalytic processes uh, involving the formation of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, and boron bonds using organometallic systems been not very well studied over the years, or not very well developed, let's say. Well, the reason is that there's some missing organometallic chemistry, like the reductive elimination, the, the reaction that would form couple two ligands at a metal to make an amine or an ether or a thioether product. That was an unknown reaction when we began our studies at Yale. Uh, for the additions to olefins uh, using amines uh, as reagents, one might draw a mechanism where the metal would insert, insert into the NH bond in a so-called oxidative addition process. And these reactions were also unknown when we started our work. Insertions of olefins into metal carbon bonds, after all, is, uh, is a reaction that uh, leads to polymerization with Ziegler and Otta type catalysts. But insertions of olefins into metal nitrogen or metal oxygen bonds was an unknown reaction. And finally, um, an important step for the CH activation chemistry, the reaction where the, a ligand from the metal gets transferred uh, to an alkane or an arene to generate a free functionalized product was also uh, not unknown, but not very well developed. So one of the fundamental questions that I'll uh, address in today's lecture is how does the differences in the polarity of the metal ligand bond and how does the presence of a lone pair 
or an, uh, or an unoccupied non-bonded orbital affect the rates and selectivities and ability to conduct these types of reactions and then to build catalytic cycles. So let me first talk about the chemistry uh, involving metal boreal compounds, and this is going to lead us to uh, some very selective CH bond functionalization processes involving that productive sigma bonded ligand exchange reaction at the bottom of the last slide. So what we've been able to do is to develop a catalyst for the selective functionalization of the terminal CH bond of an alkane. So we don't cleave CAC bonds as in cracking, and we don't do dehydrogenation at internal positions. We functionalize the terminal position. And what I thought I should do is to really show you some of the first experiments that led to those catalysts to give you a sense of how the discovery process works in this area. So uh, what we had initially sought to do was to use photochemistry to homolize the metal boron bond and generate an unusual uh, boron radical. Instead, these compounds reacted photochemically to cleave the CH bond of an arene and generate a new carbon boron bond in an aeroboronate ester that are the reagents used in Suzuki cross-coupling. We then sought systems that would do the same transformation with alkanes and found that this could be done with a tungsten instead of an iron system and could be done to give a single uh, regioisomeric product. Okay, so the only cleavage and functionalization of the terminal CH bond. So how do we make that into a catalytic process? That was the initial observation. And so what we considered was that we could use a boron reagent at, like the one shown here, which has now become commercially available and sold uh, in kilogram quantities by companies in China as well as in the U.S. And what other groups had shown was that transition metal complexes would dissociate a ligand, insert into the boron-boron bond to generate metal boral complexes. Now that compound looks like the compound on the last slide that cleaved a CH bond. So if that happened, one could generate the free <coughs> functionalized product, a borane byproduct, and then we could recycle the, me the resulting metal complex with the diboron reagent to create a catalytic cycle. To do that, we needed complexes where the ligands would dissociate under mild conditions. And so we turned to this rhodium hexamethylbenzene complex. Uh, this is hexamethylbenzene is loosely bound to the metal and then would dissociate under mild thermal conditions. The resulting intermediate uh, would then insert into the boron-boron bond to generate the catalyst. So that was the idea. And as you can see in this reaction, that works very nicely. Uh, this diboron reagent can be used with a rhodium catalyst that I show up here in substoichiometric quantities under relatively high temperatures for homogeneous catalysis, low temperatures for heterogeneous catalysis uh, to cleave the terminal CH bond and generate these products. And the selectivity is maintained whether the, the substrate is purely an alkane where R equals H or substrates with oxygen, nitrogen that might be expected to direct the catalyst toward a CH bond or even a fluoride where the terminal, where the terminal position uh, contains about as, well, the smallest atom that you can have other than hydrogen, and still the reaction occurs at the other end. Now, uh, the reaction can occur with low molecular weight alkanes, but it can also occur with high molecular weight alkanes, polyolefins. And so one can take a polyolefin like the uh, octene ethylene copolymer produced by Dow, the engage polymer, and do a functionalization on this. So we can cleave the terminal CH bond, install boron there, uh, and then use standard oxidative procedures to oxidize the carbon boron bond and make new polymers that have polar functionality at the terminus of the side chains of this material. Okay? And we do this without any change in the molecular weight properties of the polymer. So I just show here in this table the polydispersity indexes of the functionalized material and they're the, within experimental error of those of the starting material. So we've also extended this chemistry recently to the functionalization of arenes. And it turns out this is an easier reaction in many ways, but in some ways a more practical process. This was developed in collaboration with Tatsuo Ishiyama, a former visiting scientist in my laboratory, and Norio Miyayura of the Suzuki Miyayura reaction, the cross-coupling reaction with boron reagents. And what we found is that one can use the same diboron reagent with an arene and now an iridium catalyst containing this di-T-butyl bipyridine ligand. And that leads to the functionalization of arenes. And it leads to the functionalization of arenes with control of regiochemistry by steric effects. So a 1,2 di-substituted arene, symmetrically di-substituted, gives a single product. 
Maybe more important, a 1,3 disubstituted arene, unsymmetrically disubstituted, gives a single product, even if some of the substituents are the classic ortho para directors. And with heterocycles, one gets very selective uh, cleavage of a C and functionalization of a CH bond in some cases. So this is chemistry that's now been uh, conducted on at least a large scale for this type of synthesis. So this reaction has now been conducted on, you know, 10 to 40 kilogram scales to make reagents that are then carried forward to make pharmaceutical candidates that have been used in animal testing. But I'd like to return to the issue of mechanism and fundamental principles. So the catalytic cycle for this process, uh, as deduced by a number of studies I don't have time to go into, showed that the boron binds to the metal in this sort of a four-legged piano stool compound. So a cyclopentadienyl uh, CP star ligand on the top, uh, two boral ligands or three boral ligands if X equals another boral. We've shown that these dissociate borane to generate CP star rhodium uh, species that are now unsaturated. Right? And so this is now being an unsaturated complex, can bind and cleave the CH bond of an alkane to generate an intermediate with a carbon boron bond and a carbon carbon, uh, and a metal carbon bond. Sorry, with a metal boron and metal carbon bond. That reductively eliminates to release the functionalized product, generating another unsaturated intermediate that re-adds the diboron reagent. Okay, so one question in this cycle is whether there really is anything special about having boron as, as a ligand on the metal for the CH bond cleavage. And we've addressed this by two different types of experiments and also by theory. So if they take this tungsten complex with a tungsten carbon bond to an aryl ligand and irradiate that compound in benzene, if the CH bond cleavage occurs independent of the boral ligand, then something should happen with this compound. We should make biarils or we should make tungsten uh, aryl compounds. But there's no reaction. So it does seem that the boron ligand triggers CH bond cleavage. But not any boron ligand. If the p orbital at boron is part of an aromatic system, reducing its Lewis acidity, uh, then again, no reaction occurs. So to explain the role of the p orbital in the CH bond cleavage step, we turn to some uh, a collaboration with Mike Hall's group at Texas A&M, who did computational uh, studies on this system. And so recall that we're trying to understand the role of that orbital in this CH bond cleavage step. And so the overall process uh, that was calculated was with an iron system that cleaves alky alkyl CH bonds. Um, and as a model, we use methane as the reagent. And so we take the, those two materials, react to form an iron hydride and the functionalized product. And so this occurs through the following intermediates. The first step is to bind the alkane to the metal. The second step is to cleave the CH bond. And what results from that CH bond cleavage is a complex with a borane ligand bound to the metal. That borane ligand uh, then must rotate to put the boron cis to the alkyl group to generate the functionalized product. So the important thing in this pathway, uh, in this computation, computation of this pathway, is that the actual CH bond cleavage step occurs through a relatively low barrier of only 13 kilocalories per mole. And the reason for that low barrier is that the boron ligand is a good bridging ligand because it has this extra orbital. Right? It can bridge well between the iron and the hydride, and it can also allow the hydride to bridge well between the methyl group and the boron. Now, if you consider, uh, and so what that leads to is the conclusion is that the CH bond cleavage occurs with the assistance by the boron p orbital. And as a comparison, one can look at the reaction of a, the transition state for the reaction of an iron methyl compound with methane. Now, you don't have the extra orbital. The methyl group is a weaker bridging ligand, uh, and the barrier is about twice as high as the barrier is for CH bond cleavage by the metal boral compound. So why boron seems to be so far unique in being able to use these sorts of homogeneous catalysts to selectively cleave the terminal CH bond? Actually, as far as I know, it's the only catalyst in chemistry, enzymatic, heterogeneous, homogeneous, that will, for every substrate, cleave the terminal CH bond selectively. So the first uh, key aspect of this is the participation of the p orbital, as I just showed you. 
The second is the reversal of bond polarity leads to the release of the functionalized product. So the electronegativity is also important. And then the third is a thermodynamic issue. A carbon boron bond is actually very strong, and that makes the thermodynamics for the overall process, cleaving what's typically a strong CH bond, uh, to be a thermodynamically very favorable process for the diboron reagents, and it's also thermodynamically favorable for simply coupling uh, the borane, the second phase of that catalytic process. So let me spend the, rem the remainder of my time talking about uh, catalysis through amido complexes uh, and now the role of the uh, electron pair in controlling catalysis. And what I'm going to talk about are palladium-catalyzed aromatic substitution reactions. Now this project really had as, as its uh, motivation some work that had been, been done 25 years ago, 10 years before uh, we had begun our work in this area, a paper by Kosugi and Megita in 1983 showing that tin amides would react with aryl halides to form a new carbon-nitrogen bond. Those reactions occurred with palladium catalyst containing a very hindered monophosphine ligand. Nobody used that chemistry for 10 or 15 years, right? And the reason is because the tin reagents are toxic, they're unstable, they can't be purified. So this became an attractive process for the synthesis of aromatic amines um, when uh, both Steve Buckwald's group at MIT and my group at Yale published in 1995 that one could use amines in the presence of a base with the aryl halide to form this product. And I just show in red that the catalyst we used was actually the same catalyst as used in the Kosugi and Megita process. An, an earlier publication of a single example of this uh, was, was from a Ukrainian group published in the Russian literature, and that was recently translated. So I don't have time to go through all of the developments of this area over the years, um, but I'd like to just briefly point out uh, that there have been several generations of catalysts which have had a significant impact on the scope of this reaction and the ability to use this reaction to generate materials, uh, uh, ligands for other catalysts and pharmaceuticals. The first generation catalyst, as I just showed, contained the same ligand as in the Kosugi and Megita system, and that allowed coupling of secondary amines. The second generation of catalysts are ligands, I should have drawn the structures here for you guys, but this is diphenylphosphenylferrocene and binaphthal-based ligands, so they're bisphosphenes that have aromatic groups on the phosphorus. Those allowed coupling of primary amines. But soon thereafter, many different groups began to investigate sterically hindered alkyl phosphenes, monophosphine ligands, so alkyl phosphenes that are typically thought of as being very air-sensitive phosphenes and therefore not very practical. But that turned out not to be the case, and for example, this QFOS ligand that's based on a ferrocene unit that we developed is air-stable. Steve Buckwald has developed a family of ligands that are now widely used. They're air-stable, and others have developed ligands as well. But what I'd like to talk to you about today is our recent effort to blend the second and third generation ligands to use bisphosphenes that have sterically hindered alkyl substituents on them. And this is a set of ligands that was developed for asymmetric hydrogenation, but we've used them for coupling to form carbon-nitrogen bonds, and the picture of the ligand is shown here. It's got a ferrocene unit in the back, T-butyls on this phosphorus, cyclohexyls on this phosphorus, and it's rigid and chelating. So this ligand has, uh, what, uh, we began to use this ligand when we had the following objectives for the development of this chemistry. To allow the coupling of aryl chlorides with high turnover numbers. So aryl chlorides have relatively strong carbon chlorine bonds relative to the other, or carbon halogen bonds relative to the other halogens. And they also, uh, and so one challenge for sort of an academic is to learn about how to cleave typically unreactive and strong bonds. But from the practical standpoint, more aryl chlorides are commercially available than aryl bromides, and they're also less expensive. But if you need more catalyst to do the reaction of an aryl chloride, then you've lost the cost advantage of using a chloride over a bromide. So that's why the high turnover numbers is important. We need to couple primary means with high turnover numbers. They uh, typically reacted with low turnover numbers. And we need to be able to couple heteroaromatic systems because, after all, those are really the core of most medicinally active compounds. And for, again, uh, to be able to streamline synthesis, avoid protecting groups, we'd like to be able to use ammonia as a nucleophile to go straight to primary aromatic amines. 
And so we've been able to address, if not meet, these objectives by using these sterically hindered bidentate alkyl phosphines. And so let me show you just a few examples of the development of the scope and, and, and utility of this chemistry. Chi Long Shen was a graduate student in the lab that really set out initially to address three of those challenges simultaneously. To address the coupling of a primary amine with a heteroaromatic system, but a, with a, containing a halogen that's a chloride, so the least reactive of the chloride bromide iodide series. And what he showed is that we could go down to very low percent catalyst loadings, percentages of palladium, and still get good yields of the coupled products. So for example, with just 10 parts per million palladium, we can substitute at the two position. That's a bit activated, so maybe more remarkable is the coupling at the three position with only 50 parts per million of palladium ligand complex. So with these sorts of loadings of palladium, the cost of the ligand and the metal is actually lower for almost any substrate prepared for fine chemicals than the cost of the reagents, and actually the cost of the base, it turns out, is the highest component in these systems. So it, what's important is to be able to couple uh, the substrates with various substituents in different positions, like particularly in the orthos position, that still works. Um, we can couple not just a simple pro linear primary amine, but benzyl amines and amines with branching alpha to nitrogen like cyclohexyl t-butylamine, and to couple chiral amines and maintain the optical activity or uh, the uh, enantiomeric excess at the position alpha to nitrogen. So we've also been able to use the same conditions to do these reactions to make aromatic uh, carbon-nitrogen bonds as well as the heteroaromatic ones I showed on the last slide. And the conditions are really basically the same. We need a little bit more catalyst, um, but we're still often at the 50 to 100 part per million level, low enough that the cost of the catalyst is, is not so important. And again, we can couple benzylamine, octylamine, we can have branching alpha to nitrogen in a cyclic or an acyclic system, and these reactions occur uh, with good conversions and high isolated yields. Now, another important issue for the utility of this chemistry to make medicinally active compounds is a to high tolerance for uh, functional groups. And so what I show here is that if we change the base to lithium hexamethyl disilazid, so a silamide base, then we can conduct this reaction very selectively to form carbon-nitrogen bonds in the presence of other functional groups. So in the presence of a hydroxyl group, this alcohol, the amine reacts preferentially to form that carbon-nitrogen bond. Okay, we can have a, a phenolic hydroxyl group. The reaction occurs at the amine. And we can also have functional groups like uh, a ketone with enolizable hydrogens, an amid nitrogen here or here, and a free carboxylic acid. So the catalyst is not poisoned, and the reaction, the catalyst selectively goes after the aromatic halide and the mean and brings those two groups together. Now, as I mentioned, we are also interested in using the simplest amine, um, uh, if you will, ammonia, and to be able to go selectively to primary amines. And there are a number of challenges I won't go into the details of, but the products of these reactions, like this one, is the kind of amine I just showed you undergoes the coupling process. So one issue of selectivity is to get formation of the monoaryl amine, the primary amine, from reaction with ammonia. We can do that by using an excess of ammonia when there's no steric bias, to use a pressure of ammonia here, and somewhat dilute conditions. But if we have an ortho substituent on the aromatic ring, then this be does not become a problem, and we can use atmospheric pressures of ammonia and do the coupling to make um, the series of different amines I show here. Uh, we can also do the same type of chemistry on heteroaromatic systems. With a chelating ligand, the palladium is not poisoned by the pyridine nitrogen. Okay, so I thought I would just uh, finish this uh, section on the methodology development to give you a sense of where this type of chemistry has been used. Okay, so in some cases it's our catalyst, in some cases it's Steve Buckwald's catalyst that's been developed at MIT, or Matthias Beller's catalyst in Rostock, or Steve Nolan's catalyst. But these are the kinds of molecules people have used this chemistry to make. So this is a compound, this, these n aryl-piperazines. Um, where many, many types of these compounds have been formed, uh, are prepared by forming that carbon-nitrogen bond with the palladium catalysis. Uh, the TPD compounds that are useful as whole transport layers and, and organic light-emitting diodes, many uh, derivatives of these have been prepared using the carbon-nitrogen bond-forming chemistry. 
This is a compound that's, that is a Pfizer compound that actually sadly w uh, died in the th last stages of the final clinical trials. Um, but in any case, there are other compounds coming along of its structural type, and that carbon-nitrogen bond is formed in uh, using the palladium-catalyzed coupling chemistry. And Dick Schrock, who gave a toast last night, has used this chemistry many times to make uh, the carbon-nitrogen bond in some of the ligands that he's used to make, do catalytic synthesis of ammonia with molybdenum and also to generate olefin polymerization catalysts. So he does this with his colleague Steve Buckwell's catalyst, but I think our systems would work just as well or better. But in fact, we can do even more than formation of carbon-nitrogen bonds. So CO bond formation has frustrated us for many years. Others have been more successful with that. But we've recently found that the same type of catalyst containing this very sterically hindered bidentate ligand can form thioethers. And I thought I would insert this into the talk because, of course, sulfur is commonly thought of as a poison for catalysts, late transition metal catalysts. But it's not poisoned, in, it, it's not a poison for this homogeneous system with a tight binding phosphine. And so again, I show we can form the carbon sulfur bond, this carbon sulfur bond, through this process in the presence of an ester, or a nitrile, an acid, a ketone, enolizable ketone amides, aldehyde, so it's very selective for forming the carbon-sulfur bond. So about six billion dollars worth of uh, 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 sulfoxides are sold per year uh, for uh, medicinal purposes, acid reflux actually, and, and so those sulfoxides are made from uh, the sulfides by asymmetric oxidation of the sulfides. And so this is a way that people can put together a variety of combinations to make sulfox sulfides, oxidize them to sulfoxides, and look at their medicinal activity. So I want to close by returning to some of the issues that I talked about at the beginning. So how does the electronegativity of nitrogen, the polarity of the bond, and the basicity of the lone pair affect this reaction chemistry? And so the the mechanism for this catalytic process is summarized on this slide. A palladium zero species inserts into the carbon halogen bond to make an aryl palladium halide complex. That reacts with amine and base to generate an aryl palladium amido species. And then that undergoes that reductive elimination step that was on one of the early slides that looks fine on a paper or on a slide, but when we began this work, there was no precedent for that step. So one question, and over the years, has been what are the uh, properties of the catalyst that are going to affect that step, okay? And as pointed out in the last lecture, we can make a change to the catalyst and maybe make some prediction about what would happen to this step, but if we want to improve the selectivity of this portion of the cycle, going in the reverse and designing a catalyst is a little more difficult. But in any case, we've learned about how some of the factors that control the rate of that step and the electronic properties of the nitrogen is one particularly important property. The more basic the nitrogen, the faster the rate of these reductive elimination steps. Okay? So the alkylamides eliminate the fastest, aryl slower, diaryl still slower, and then amidate uh, requires high temperatures, long times, and the yield of the product is low with this sort of ordinary uh, aromatic bisphosphine ligand. So how do the electronic properties, uh, how do the electronic properties of an alkyl ligand affect the rate of CC bond formation? And can we use that as a comparison to the data I just showed you on the previous slide to understand the role of the heteratom? And so, and as part of studies on the formation of uh, alpha aryl compounds and then a m broader mechanistic study, we looked at, at the electronic effects on reductive elimination to make the carbon-carbon bond by looking at methyl, benzyl, enolate, and, and having increasing electron withdrawing power on the carbon bound to the metal. So as that, uh, electron, as, as that electron withdrawing power increases, the rate of the reaction decreases. Exactly the same effect as I showed you for the formation of carbon-nitrogen bonds. So our conclusion then about the control of electronics on this reaction uh, is that the effect is transmitted more through the sigma bond than it is through the non-bonded electron pair. And so in this chemistry, I think the non-bonded orbital is really a spectator more than it is an active participant as it was in the formation, in the CH activation by the compounds with carbon-boron bonds. 
So let me then summarize by going back to the issues we were trying to address in the beginning. So how does polarity and the non-bonded orbital affect these reactions? So it, the polarity retards the rate of reductive elimination, as I just showed you. Fortunately, it retards the rate of, that should be a beta, of beta hydrogen elimination, which is a side reaction that leads to undesirable products. In the CH activation chemistry, I didn't point this out, but the electrophilicity of boron makes for a strong bond to, to the metal, but it's kinetically react, uh, active because the unoccupied non-bonded orbital opens up new pathways for CH bond cleavage and also promotes the formation of the carbon-boron bond in the end. So these are some of the, uh, the conclusions about the two types of chemistry I talked about today, but the other projects have also taught us that the lone pair of nitrogen can be important. It can interfere with desired reactions like the insertion of a metal into the NH bond, the metal just binds to the lone pair, but it can promote other reactions like olefin insertion. So the rules are more complex than simply a hard soft mismatch or mis uh, between a soft metal and hard oxygen or nitrogen ligands. And it's also more complex than factors in, than simply destabilization through d pi p pi bonding. So having electrons on the metal and electrons in the p orbital lead to a destabilization. So I don't think it's simply th those factors that are involved. These are the factors that are involved. And I think we can understand those factors and use those factors in the design of catalysts for, oops, design of catalysts for valuable, synthetically valuable processes. Processes that are not going to be, you know, used on the millions and billions per pound uh, per, uh, uh, scale that are uh, familiar to many of you uh, interested in commodity chemicals, but will have a real impact on how we uh, make molecules for medicinal purposes, for materials chemistry, and also put ligands on catalysts um, that do make the kinds of materials like polyolefins that we make on the million uh, or billions of pound per year scale. So that's the end of the, the science of today's lecture, and I thought I should just go back and acknowledge uh, the students who have been involved in this. These are essentially all of the people who have passed through my laboratory and have worked on the coupling chemistry, CH activation, hydroamination, the fundamental organometallic chemistry involved. And in the two projects that I talked about today, um, I was actually remiss, and, and I usually put names with people along the way. Karen Waltz was the one who first discovered the CH activation. Huyan Chen turned that into a catalytic process. The mechanistic work I talked about was Kevin Cook's and Doris Kunz's. And I mentioned the collaborators along the way, and Mark Hillmeyer is the person that we have done the polyolefin functionalization with. In the cross-coupling area, a number of students and postdocs have worked on that as well. The really recent work I talked about on using the fourth generation catalyst was work of Qilong Shen and Manuel Fernandez. Um, and uh, so I am really very appreciative of the, the work by these students. And as I said, many of the reaction that, we dis that we've developed and the ligands we've discovered have really been done by them. Uh, and uh, it's really fun to watch these people develop over time and to be a part of their progress. So thanks to them and thanks to you for your attention. And Thank you, Charles, for the excellent talk. And please join me to thank all the two speakers this morning, Professor Moskov and Professor Hartwig again. Thank you. Thank you.